Very thankful for the opportunity to be here once more, and especially for the privilege and honor of being able to stand before you to proclaim the wonderful gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a privilege and honor it is. Last evening we talked a little bit about uh, reaching out to others and being able to talk to others and having something to say. And uh, this morning I want to talk about uh, a particular, uh, I'll be re referencing some things in happened in my life uh, and how God has helped me. And I think that uh, uh, perhaps uh, can encourage us. Uh, maybe sometimes we have a hard time thinking of uh, what we would say if given the opportunity. We know that the Bible says to be ready always to give a defense of the hope that is in you. That when people ask a reason of the hope, to be ready to answer with meekness and uh, with care, but to be ready, prepared, to be th think ahead of time of have something to say. What would I, if given the opportunity, what could I talk about? The lesson this morning is over the 23rd Psalm. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thousands, perhaps millions, have been comforted by these six verses, they compose the most loved poetry in the world. They make a good lesson for us because we are sheep, and sheep need a shepherd. There are rich blessings found here for the Lord's sheep. Someone said that a great orator eloquently read this psalm to a large audience. The people were not very impressed. That another man, unpolished as we'd say, arose and read it, and people were deeply stirred. When someone asked what made the difference, the first man replied, I know the psalm. He knows the shepherd. What a difference it makes to know the shepherd. I'm going to talk about a difficult time of my life, but not to be talking about me. It's about the shepherd that I really want to emphasize. I want to point you to the shepherd, and I believe that the greatest thing that I can ever help anybody with in any situation is to point them to the shepherd. And so we want to look at this. He says that the Lord is my shepherd. David was a good shepherd, but the Lord was his shepherd. In the Original, I guess it was Yahweh or Jehovah, however you prefer to pronounce it. But this refers to Jesus, who is our shepherd today. He is the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He's called the chief shepherd by Peter in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, 
but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. He is the shepherd and bishop or overseer of ourselves. 1 Peter 2, verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He's the good shepherd in John chapter 10. Verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. But all of this means nothing to me, unless I can say he's my shepherd. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows me, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He knows my name, John 10, verse three. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And so this morning, we should claim him as our shepherd. Let him be our shepherd. I shall not want. For the true Christian, there is nothing lacking. Matthew six thirty three. but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. There is no physical need that he cannot supply. There is no emotional need that he cannot soothe. Second Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There is no spiritual need that he cannot feel. In Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, when I worked up this lesson, I was uh, in a deep depression. It had not been that long since I'd lost my dad. And uh, I had knew nothing about grieving processes. I, I was so ignorant about what to expect of myself. And so I, I literally thought, it's over for me. I couldn't concentrate. I started looking into possibility of looking at some other type of career to get into uh, that I wasn't going to be able to uh, preach. And I was needing a lesson in that. Uh, Brother Austin, you're going to find yourself at times uh, needing a lesson, needing a sermon. And so I go through my file, go over to my file, and I have this one file that I have sermon ideas that from time to time I just jot a note down and stick it in there and, and think about maybe working something up from it later. And I found this thing about wolves. Well, we had this young in the faith couple at, at our congregation and they had a lot of denominational background and there was a lot of weeds in their garden that needed to be uprooted in order to plant the the seed of the kingdom, to plant the truth, to let it have a chance to grow. And so I was concerned about them because of the influence that they had. And, and I pulled this up and there's uh, some ideas and thoughts about wolves. You know, there are wolves and we're sheep. And we need to realize that we have to be cautious and we have to be careful about uh, what we hear and how much influence things have on us. We need to search the scriptures to make sure that things are true. 
And so I was looking through there, and I, I like this, and I'm developing that. And then I get to think, well, you know, this is really negative. This is like a pretty dark picture of the life of a Christian. Uh, I, I want to be able to turn that around. Uh, what could, well, it led me to John 10, because I thought, I'll talk some about the shepherd, you know. And I thought, you know, just be a, a quick point to kind of end it with and I read John 10 and and I thought you know I remember people talking about there was a book I guess written by a shepherd and on the 23rd psalm a uh, shepherd looks at the psalm uh, something to that effect and I thought well I'll just go over to psalm 23 and see maybe there's a few points I can get from that and I can say something about the shepherd and, and then end on a good note and and all. Well, back then, we didn't have the software and stuff that we do today, the quality the and everything. The Bible program I had uh, pretty well took up the whole screen and a few verses. And I'm sitting in my office, I've gotten up early I have uh, decided to force myself to be more disciplined and, and study. And so I'm there in my office and I begin to scroll through the 23rd Psalm. And as I went through it, uh, I discovered Psalm 23. And I focused again on the shepherd. And so I don't care what anybody's going through. And I don't mean that I choose words so carefully sometimes that I stick my foot in my mouth. But I don't mean it doesn't matter to me if you're hurting. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of hurt you're going through. You need the shepherd. No one can do for you what the shepherd. And to lose your focus on him will cause things to be worse than necessary in your life. And this shepherd, as he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or I have no lack. I'm not missing anything. Like the song that we have sung before, nothing more I need, Christ the Lord is mine. Well, as I'm reading through this, I, I'm gathering and, and I'm just sitting back and thinking about every phrase. And that's what became this lesson. And this morning, believe me, I may mention wolves, but I'm not pointing you to the wolves. I want to point you to the shepherd. There are wolves, but we have a marvelous shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He calms my fears. He dries my tears. These drive us to our Father. Matthew, you know that uh, being a son of a preacher, you get sometimes uh, find yourself in some of these lessons. When Matthew was very small, he did not like bugs. I'm not saying he loves them now. I'm saying any bug and I'd lost my dad, so I'm very, very overprotective. I mean, I hear Matthew in the backyard in that little, in, bear, more than infant, but very young, squealy voice, and something's going on, and man, I'm hitting the door to find out because I'm, I, you know, I'm just paranoid. And uh, he runs to me, and he says... Uh, I'm sorry. That fly scare me. I need a picky up. Well, through the years I've said, you may think your son is a wimp. But I'll tell you, he's my son and I loved it. There's a few moments that go by so quickly that we get to hold our children. And uh, they outgrow that. But that fly, whatever, it didn't matter to me. It drove him to me. 
and I loved it. The things in our life that happen to us are blessings in disguise. So many times we suffer things that seem so rough, but the shepherd can guide us through these things. And I believe that they are things that are blessings because they turn us to the Father. In our congregation several years ago, a young sister came forward one Sunday morning to make a confession. And she said she had been in a wreck the night before, a single car accident. And they had to use, I think it was the jaws of life, they called it, to extract her from the car. And while she was waiting on them to get there and everything, she said, I just kept saying, I can't die, I'm not ready. I can't die, I'm not ready. And so she made a confession that Sunday morning and wanted to be forgiven and wanted to be ready. And I prayed for her and asked God to forgive her. I thanked him also for the car wreck because it drove her to him. Anything that causes you to turn to him is a blessing. And many times it takes difficult things, difficult times in life to turn us to him. But anything that turns you to God is a blessing. Count it as a blessing. Appreciate whatever it takes to bring you closer to God. Have you ever found yourself in a time of spiritual need and longed to just be picked up and held, comforted again? I have. I think spiritually we can count on that. Isaiah 40 verse 11, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the, those who are with young. Well, it says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. What contentment. You know, uh, there was there have been some experiments done with uh, prisons and such, painting the cells different colors, and they found that when the cells were painted green, there was a more calming effect on the prisoners, and the ones that were painted red, they were more aggressive. Uh, I don't know, but it used to be the scrubs that doctors wore were always green. And uh, that has a calming, soothing effect. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It makes me think of I'm laying down in a bed of food, <laughs> virtually, without all I, can, I want to eat. I've got all I need. I'm so well fed that I'm just going to rest here and lie down in this abundant field. No hunger. John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The beauty of the scene. I love scenery. love scenery pictures. I know that uh, you know as well as I do, cameras can't catch all of it. When you, you look out and you see a beautiful scene, if you're like me at least, I've tried to take pictures. When I get the pictures, and look at them later, and it's like, oh man, it just doesn't really gr capture it all, because I guess we see the such a big part at once. But anyway, I love the scenery, and I think of those things. Here's another point. He leads me. He leads me. He goes before me. John 10, 3 and 4. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I think of this, he takes the risks. He's out front. I literally remember when I was three or maybe four, uh, something like that. Uh, Matt, I was scared of the dark, okay? I, I did not like to go out in the dark. Dads, come go with me. We're going out somewhere in the dark. And I literally remember thinking, walking behind him, well, if there are any booger bears out here, they're going to get him first. 
and I, I didn't think about this, but maybe I'll have a chance to run for help. But but I re literally thought about they're going to get him first. So he leads me. He goes before me. He takes those risks. It says, beside still waters, what a beautiful thought. There is no place more peaceful for me as beside still waters. You just love it. Uh, I do just to see reflections in that water and uh, especially like a mountain mirrored in it and maybe if like a snow-capped mountain or whatever. You know, you just think about it and the beauty of God's creation mirrored in a large lake, mountains in the background. How often artists have tried to capture such a scene and it dawns on me, this is valley time. This beauty can only be beheld while in the valley. You don't get that from the mountaintop. You've got to be in that valley to appreciate that beauty. It says beside the still waters. And sheep don't like to drink fast running water, I've been told. And so uh, he leads us beside still waters where we're content with all that we need. Then, he says, he restores my soul. And right here is where this, sermon, this began to be the sermon I was going to talk about. Because I needed my soul restored. And I remember that morning just rocking back in my chair and saying, Would you restore mine? I need my soul restored it had gotten to the point so many times i thought i was better and maybe that very day be lower than ever i feel like and it's just a battle i could not get any get couldn't get over it and i told i tell cynthia from time to time i i think i'm I think i'm making it i think i'm going to be all right and then, boom. But I decided, well, I'm just not even going to tell her that anymore. So I, you know, I've been wrong so many times. I'm not even going to say it anymore. But that morning when I rocked back in my chair and asked the Lord to restore my soul, I knew he did. I knew that he did. And I told her that when she got up, and then, like I said, I got up early. I'm not, it's not like... She slept in or anything like that. But I'd gotten up early and was studying. And I went in and talked to her. And I feel like my face must have been beaming. Because I wasn't about to say, I think maybe I'm getting better. I said, I know I'm okay. I know. Because I'm not taking my eyes off of the shepherd anymore. I'm going to keep my focus where it belongs. And so he restores my soul. And I'm reminded of another refreshing that I enjoyed. In Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Again, I am refreshed by his presence. Psalm 51, 9 through 13. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He alone knows the way. He alone is righteous. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He leads me by his goodness. Romans 2 verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? I can live the Christian life 
knowing that he leads me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And then he says, for his name's sake. You know, I could easily doubt that God would care enough about me to do that for me. I know me. I'm not worth it. But I can't doubt that he would do that for his name's sake. Nobody blames the sheep for getting lost. They want to know where the shepherd was. It's his reputation that's at stake, not mine. He's the shepherd. Where was the shepherd when this took place? Why wasn't he watching? That's what gives me the confidence. It is the shepherd's reputation at stake. Zechariah 11, verse 17. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. He gives me the confidence I need to live for him. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he says, the part we think of about Psalms 20, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I'm thinking this is a much more frightening valley than the one I'm in. The one I usually find myself. And this is all that he says. And all the things that I can appreciate about Psalm 23. It's about valley time. He says, I will fear no evil. Does not say that no evil can befall the Christian. We simply do not fear it. I will fear no evil. I will not fear the possibility of future evil. Why? For you are with me. We're not left alone. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. six. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The refreshing presence of the Lord. You are with me. To know that we are with him, we are okay. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Rod was a, a club uh, to fight off the attacks, maybe from wolves or whatever. Staff was that big old tall crooked walking stick I used to think. And nobody can use that thing. But, but it was for getting sheep out of crevices when they'd fall into things. They could hook them and, and pull them out. There's security in the presence of the Lord. John chapter 10, verses 10 through 17. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this foe, them also... I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. And he says, you prepare a table before me. Nervous stomach does not rob me of my appetite. I'm scared. This is a terrible time. Sometimes people say, when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, sometimes... Unfortunately, when we can't see any way for us to get through this on our own, finally we'll turn to God. Rather than staying with God and to know that He's with us. The Lord has prepared us a table. And what a blessing it is to be able to meet around this table on the Lord's day. He says, in the presence of my enemies, sheep, have a lot of enemies. Yes, we have a lot of enemies. We are at war with evil. We must not forget who our enemies are. We have enemies. 
But in the presence of the enemies, he prepares us a table. And I think, I think back to experiences in my life. Obviously, it doesn't take a lot to influence me to eat. And when I'm bored and watching TV, when they eat, pretty much, so do I. And I was a kid, I think, um, surely it must have, it's either in the summer or I was already out of school. I, I guess it was in the summer. Dad worked a good ways from home, stayed through the week down there. He took me with him one week, and he'd go to work, and I was left at the apartment the black and white TV to watch all day. And when they'd eat, I'd eat. And he had a big old stack of bologna. And I nearly went through it the first day, I guess. And then he took me to work with him and wanted to introduce me to a lot of people. That's what the, he convinced me of anyway. But you know, if you think about that, if the wolves are anything like that, and they're hungry, and the sheep start to eat, they may start thinking about, you know, we're hungry, and they like sheep. So we have enemies, but even in this case, the sheep says, your rod and your staff comfort me. And when we might say, whoa, did you see those wolves over there? Just remind me, yes, have you seen our shepherd? You see that club he's got? They comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. This was evidently some form of medical treatment for sheep, parasites of some sort that, that would keep uh, off of their head. And sometimes our heads are infested with parasitical thinking seems to point out that the problem was in my head and I need to be reminded to turn back to the shepherd. After this marvelous internal restoration, my outward appearance changes also. My cup runs over, the necessities of life, the abundant life, John 10 and verse 10. And then there's this other phrase, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, the lasting quality of this restoration. I always said, I have my good days and my bad days. All the days of my life. If I can make myself stay focused on the shepherd, all days are good. Even bad days are good. As the song says, even the valleys are higher ground. Learn to appreciate valley time. All the days are good, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, eternally his. John 10, 28 and 29, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That is is reason to rejoice. When you learn your shepherd, when you learn this wonderful shepherd, there'll never be a time, I, I believe this, certainly, there'll never be a time when you would have trouble thinking of something to say to somebody who is tr troubled, remind them of the shepherd. Point them to the shepherd. These blessings are for the Lord's sheep. They have the following characteristics. They know the Lord. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. They hear and know his voice. John 10, 3 through 4. John 10, 16. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They follow the shepherd. His sheep know him. They know his voice. In order for you to do that, you're going to have to get to know the shepherd. And the only way to do that is to get into his word. Read the book of John. It's one of the best things you can read because he wrote that, that we might believe in Christ. 
that will produce the faith in Christ in the people who read those things that are there. And they believe the Lord. They believe the Lord. Their faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They follow him. It's not enough just to know him, know about him. We have to hear his voice and we have to follow him. We have to follow him. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They will not follow strangers. Oh, the things that wouldn't need to be addressed in the church today. If we could learn to, to know the shepherd and follow his voice and not follow strangers' voices. John 10, 5, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. If you are not one of his sheep this morning, you can become one today. If you would obey the gospel, you can be Become a member of the Lord's body and be part of his family. If you believe that Jesus indeed is the Christ, the Son of the living God, listen to him when he tells you, except you believe, you'll all likewise perish, John 8, 24. Unless you repent, you'll perish, Luke 13 and 3. Unless you confess me before men, it's put in two verses, one for confession, one for denial. But if, unless you confess me before men, I will deny you before the Father. You have to be baptized into Christ. You have to be born again, born of the water and of the Spirit, John 3, 3 through 5. If you are one of the Lord's sheep, but maybe you are that sheep that's going to stray. You know, I've often wondered how far to... How close to the brink was I in that? I don't know. I only know he didn't give up on me. And he found me. He waited and he found me. And he brought me back. And he'll do that for you. He loves you. He loves us. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to have that abundant life in Christ in spite of anything else going on in our lives around us. If you've strayed, you can come back today. 1 Peter 2, 25, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This morning, the invitation is yours. If you would consider it, if you are in need, if something has been killing you inside, you can take care of it. Get back to the shepherd. Go back and focus on the shepherd. You remember when Peter walked on water? They saw Jesus walking and he says, it's me. And I've often wondered, Peter, what were you thinking? And he says, if that's you, tell me to walk on water out to you. He says, come on. If it had been something else, what do you think they'd have said? But he said, I am he. Come, come on. And Peter walked on water until it says the waves were big. What did he do? He started looking at the waves and took his eye off of Jesus. You start looking at your problems and all you do is focus on your problems and we all have them. Maybe different levels, but we all have them. But if I get focused on those things, the wolves in life, I cannot at the same time focus on my shepherd. But if I'll focus on him, he'll lead me through. If you'd like that life today, why not? Come while we stand, while we sing the song of invitation.